All the world is a stage and all the men and women are merely players. Shakespeare, as you like it. And what a stage that we live on in this world, uh, filled with conflict and love, but also drama and comedy. Acting is that where you get to be on a stage all the time, playing to entertain us. And in film, there are two types of actors, the lead actor and the supporting actor. The lead is the one that is the driving force, usually of the film, uh, who the film centers around moving the story forward. But just because you're the lead actor doesn't mean you necessarily have the most screen time. Sir Anthony Hopkins won his best actor Oscar for his role in Silence of the Lambs for Dr. Lecter, and he was only on the screen for 16 minutes. 16 minutes seems more like a supporting actor, maybe on time, but that's not how it works. I do wish we could chat longer, but I'm having an old friend for dinner. If you're good at something, never do it for free. And supporting actors, they don't do their work for free. It is a career choice that they're making, or at least for that role. Um, yeah, top actors, lead actors get top billing and usually sometimes more of a salary. But a film is desperately needing a supporting actor to continue to tell the story. Christian Bell's Batman, he's a decent Batman. And in The Dark Knight though, he pretty much is in the shadows though due to Heath Ledger's Joker. Appropriate though for The Dark Knight to be in the shadows. But it's Heath Ledger's Joker and an Oscar winning performance that drives the conflict of the movie. Heath Ledger's Joker is not necessarily uh, an eccentric villain. He's not a monster. He's just head of a curve. The supporting actor is what's needed to be the progression for the love interest in a love story or the conflict uh, in a drama and everything in between. Uh, J.K. Simmons Fletcher in Whiplash is what makes Miles Teller's Andrew great. If there's no Fletcher, then Andrew, you know, becomes just good and not one of the best. Our next guest is a longtime career actor, Jeff Kober, who has over 135 roles to his credit. A lot of a lot of folks recognize him for his role of Joe in The Walking Dead, as Jacob Hell in Sons of Anarchy, Dodger in China Beach. Guys, welcome to another episode of Film Nation, and this time looking at the art of a supporting actor. Who is very recognizable. Uh, he is an actor, a photographer, that's one of the reasons why I met him, uh, a musician, and a teacher of meditation. Jeff, thank you so much for being a part of our class today. Oh, thanks for having me, Chad. Um, now, when you look at your IMDB page, it, hmm. is, it is a long page. I mean, you have 137 acting credits to your name. Wow. That's, uh, yeah. You know what that means? <laughs> that means I'm old. <laughs> it means you're good at what you do. Um, and with 100, out of those 137 roles, a lot of them are in that uh, guest appearance supporting yeah. role kind of character. I mean, you've been on The Walking Dead, Sons of Anarchy, CSI, NCIS, uh, and numerous more. What, how do you uh, go into a show with regular cast uh, and make these impactful characters? that are in essence supporting, um, how, how do you approach a character such as uh, any of those supporting characters? Well, you know, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating thing because the further along I've gone and the way that the, the work has changed and the business has changed, a lot of my jobs in the last few years have been like one day gigs. And you know, when you go on a movie that's gonna shoot for 10, 12 weeks, you, the first day is a gimme. You know, just I'm trying to find my way here. I'm trying to see who's, you know, who's got the power and who I have to 
you know, look up to and who do I have to look to for approval and all of that? And, and how do I fit in? What's the pecking order? All those things when I was a young, young actor. Well, I was never really a young actor but when I was younger. Um, but now is you, you walk in and there's a fully formed family. Some of them have been together for years, you know, and it's not just the actors, it's the whole crew. Everyone is all together. And you got to walk in and just and do your thing. And so the, the preparation, preparation, preparation. Okay. And, you know, the single most important thing as an actor is to know what your intention is in each scene and as a character. And when you have a strong intention, when you know what you need from the other character in a scene, then the rest of it can all sort of disappear. And it's just you and me. And I can stand toe to toe face to face with anyone, you know, and uh, my job then is to put, make this so strong that the blinders come out for all the rest of this. And I don't care who's looking at me cross-eyed and I don't care who thinks I'm a jerk or, you know, don't belong here or too old or too young or too fat or too skinny or whatever they think. It's, it's between you and me. And I'm just using the author's words, the screenwriter, the scriptwriter's words to, to have that experience between you and me. And you know, I, I can tell it, it is, a, is a practice that you have perfected because probably one of your most infamous characters in your career was the character of Joe from The Walking Dead. Um, yeah. I mean, that guy was a, a vile, uh, mean villain. But he was a villain that had principles, uh, and uh, yeah. um, and so, but with him being so vile, I mean, you made this amazing character that after a few, four episodes, I mean, you're at the end of your character's fate. I mean, people I think were probably cheering at your fate because you did such a great job of of developing this uh, vile character. So, two questions based off them. One, was Joe just a misunderstood guy and not really a villain? Uh, and two, though, and the more important one, um, for a guy that teaches meditation and peace and everything, how did you approach and create a character that is such a mean guy? Well, first of all, that character was a gift because it was so well written. And the thing about Scott Gimple, um, uh, the producer of that, of that show and... Uh, 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 Greg, uh, who, who uh, directed one of the episodes that I was on, uh, these guys, they care about character. Everything is based in character. So, and they wanted that death to count. Yeah. And they needed some guy who was strong enough that it brought their Andrew Lincoln character uh, or his character to actually ripping someone's throat out with his teeth. Because that whole, that whole season, he had been about pacifism. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to stop killing so it had to be heinous enough that it would make him kill, right. you know? So of course they called on me. Now, so the, uh, the first thing is, again, it, 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 he is a man with principles and that show posits this great question. What would you be willing to do? You know, what would, what would, what would you actually be willing to do? And, and you forget, people forget that we did to we wanted to do to him what we wanted to do to him because of what he did to us he killed one of ours and left him turn zombie to attack us he did that to us so you know he had to pay a price for that that was the that was the storyline um so you know he broke one of the cardinal principles and they set it up so that this guy had certain principles that he lived by and he had integrity within those principles and the one of the secrets there is that everything is looked at through the eyes of the good guy andrew lincoln and he's a much better person <laughs> than this person but still th this guy's side of the story was it, it didn't matter by the time we got to me dying but the the most important thing as a performer is you never play evil you play reality and integrity and and a full heart and a loving soul and the context will tell the story for you oh wow when i i did a, a role on with uh, uh mariska hargitay on uh uh svu 
and uh, uh, Law and Order. And I was a, a, a awful uh, cult leader, a murderer of children. I had a 12 year old wife, just this awful human being. And I played it as a man of God. Okay. And when I asked her, God, how can you put yourself through this every day? Oh, you were, you were molested as a child too. Oh, I'm so sorry. You know, I meant it. I meant every word of it. I was just absolutely, you know, feeling compassion for her, for her character. And I was just having fun on the set. And my wife and a couple of friends and I were going to watch the show when it came on. I lasted two minutes. I couldn't watch it. It was so ugly and so nasty. But when I was playing it, I wasn't being evil. I was being real and truthful and a man of God. So what you're doing is you find the good side of these, because I mean, a lot of your, your characters have been on the dark side. And so you're it's, finding it, the good in them. I don't find, I don't find the good. I find the, the true. Okay. Okay. The true is a spiritual concept. Okay. Truth is that which never changes. Now, Joe probably was, a, I, I, I figured he was a, a mechanic before this all happened. Right. He was just having a life. He had a family. You know, he drank beers at night and, and he had a good life. And, and all this happened. And then he saw stupid people doing stupid things. And he started coming up with, how do we stay alive? Well, you know, you got to make some rules. And you got to have people around you to keep you alive. What are the rules that we can stay together under? And he started coming up with these rules. They were based in necessity. And now looked at from the outside, they're evil. But from his perspective, it was like, this is how I'm staying alive. Not at your expense, but also if you get in my way, it will be at your expense. So It is protection. Um, let's say you're out at dinner uh, or out in the community prior to this COVID situation kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And a, a fan comes up to you and like, is like, oh my gosh, you're Joe, or you're Jacob Hell from Sons of Anarchy, the, the creepy guy from Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Um, and instead of knowing your name of being Jeff, or they just like, hey honey, oh my gosh, it's Joe, or it's, you know, Jacob, you know, what is that like when a fan, is that a compliment? Is it, is it hurtful? What is it like when fans come up to you and just recognize you as one of these amazing supporting characters you have done? Um, you know, I, I just, uh, I, I'm, I'm as gracious as I know how to be. I'm grateful that I have a, a job that uh, uh, keeps paying the bills and that, uh, that, I've done things that have actually been noticed by people. Mm -hmm. And and I know that, you know, there's a thing that it's also another thing about performance. If you stay in the business as long as I have, it, the, there's you and then there's the character. There's you and then there's the business. There's you and there's what people project on you. And when I'm doing the job, again, that 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 thing that you you base your character in the truth of what you are, there's a truth inside me that never changes. Then there are different personalities that that truth expresses through. They're recognizing the personality. And I don't take credit for that. Okay. I take credit for doing the homework to allow that to exist. So when someone says, hey, I recognize that, I go, oh, thank you. That was, yeah, that was, that was a fun one. Yeah, it's good. Thank you. Yeah, and then we can bond over that. But it's, you're not talking to me. You're talking to that. Oh, I see. Oh, I okay. You do do a great job of preparing, um, as we've already discussed. Has there, and, and like there's the story of like uh, Heath Ledger when he was preparing for The Dark Knight and his role of a Joker. He went, it went, he went to a point that he was, so like his family believed he might not have came back from. Has there ever been a character in your preparation that you were haunted by or you still are haunted by? There's, um, well, there, there, there are two roles that, that spring to mind. Uh, the first is, I did a movie called The First Power years ago. Okay. And it, Lou Diamond Phillips and, and uh, Jenny Wright. And uh, I played a guy who basically made a deal with Satan so that he could come back after he was executed. And it was based on uh, Richard Ramirez, the Hillside Strangler. And I, I went and I saw part of his trial. I... Uh, huh. Uh, I, I delved into looking into some, uh, you know, dark spirituality, 
Um, the guy who wrote it, Bob Reznikoff, studied some dark spirituality, uh, some satanic stuff, and put it into the script. More people were injured on that set than any movie I've ever worked on. Um, you know, I, I got a broken rib. The uh, uh, producer fell down the stairs in front of me and broke her ankle. Uh, three different stuntmen were seriously injured on it. You know, time after time after time, people were hurt. There was, there was dark energy there. Sure. And I didn't know how to protect myself. And all I knew how to do was to do it as real as possible. And some of that stuff stuck to me for a while. Okay. You know, because I don't think darkness is dangerous unless you, unless you welcome it. And, and if you welcome it, then, you know, then you're going to deal with what you deal with. So there's that. And I, I, would, I would do that role completely differently today than I did it then. The other one is uh, the role I did on China Beach, where I played a Marine who had seen too much. Yes. And a long range recon Marine. And I was, you know, the guy with a thousand yard stare. And that was interesting in that I, I wasn't making that up. That was part of me that I was letting come out, that I was given an opportunity to express. So that one was actually healing to be, to let that part of my self show within the context of that story. So it's, you know, it's two different approaches that, cause I, I'm not that darkness and, and, uh, but I am that, uh, I was that depth of damage and, and uh, sorrow and, and that, that, and that, and doing that role, it was about Vietnam and about Vietnam veterans. And so it mattered. And so I knew that I was using what was wounded in me for good. Okay. It was like bringing it out so that it could be, healed in others if you will not that i was a you know, it was the whole show was doing that not just me and i got to be a part of that so it was, as it was healing for others for veterans it was also healing for me and the only for all of us in that cast and and crew and and uh writing and directing department what mattered was for veterans to come up and say uh, you, you did it right i recognize myself in that thank you you know that's that's what mattered and and if that character, I mean, he finds redemption eventually by, like, post-war by being a pre like, he goes into ministry, I think, correct? And he does. Did you, do you, did you, do you have veterans that come up to you and say, thank you for, for what you did and on that role then? Uh, veterans, yeah. Uh, not, no, I, I don't think any preachers have come up. <laughs> <laughs> Although, that other one, the first power, we did some work in a Catholic church here in, uh, in Los Angeles and one of the scenes was me standing on the altar doing a crucifixion, uh, mocking a crucifixion and then doing some satanic jump off of there. And the priest came up to me during a break cause he didn't see any Then he says, I hope you're not doing anything to bring down the wrath of God on us. <laughs> and of course I was, so. Um. <laughs> Looking again, and you're, you're going to your movie experience, uh, one of the characters that probably required a heavy amount of daily preparation was the character of Booga from Tank Girl. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, that was a lot of prosthetic makeup. Yeah. Can you walk what it's like for my guys to understand what it would be, what it's like to, how, how much earlier do you have to go for a calling for a, something that, requires that much makeup and what's that process like? How is it to be able to develop a character with it? Because you can still tell it's you. I mean, you, you pour her out of this character, uh, even through all this makeup, and then what it's like to close that down too. Well, when you start a job like that, the, the, the initial makeup sessions were five to six hours long. Oh my. Yeah, just getting it put on. Then they, you know, they, they got it down to maybe three, three and a half hours. Um, and, you know, because it was, it was the full face. It was uh, 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 servo motors for the ears under the skull. Uh, there was a, a skull cap. There were uh, rubber hands. There was a, a mechanical tail that you had to put on, uh, all these different things. And so it was really intense. And, you know, and you got someone poking at your face for five hours. And you, there, I did another job called Alien Nation. And 
one of the actors who worked almost every day on that after a day about day 56 lost it it's and and just tore his rubber the rubber off his face it couldn't the latex he couldn't take it anymore uh, because it's uh Again, you've got to find that this is where meditation comes in. You got to find that quiet place inside so that what's happening out here isn't uh, affecting you the way it could affect you. Um, and then uh, and and then you're able to, you know, disappear inside that character even more because you're all covered up. And, you know, and and uh, and I, that that character was interesting. It's the only character I've ever done. That was based on an animal. I have a friend, Mark Roberts, who did uh, Two and a Half Men and uh, uh, Mike and Molly. He created both those shows, and and he's an actor too. And and he, the only thing he does is he chooses an animal for each of his characters. That's all he does. He's like, I'm being a bear in this one, you know. And I was an animal in that, uh, though I was playing something that was half human, half kangaroo. Right. I played it as a Newfoundland. You could go back and watch it. It's like a big shambling newfoundland dog um and that's all i you know i just sort of sort of did that and then the dialogue took, took care of the rest of it and the and the costume and the, the face and then then the end of the day it's a you know it's an hour or so to take all that that glue and rubber off and and you you, you go home and uh put something on your face to take away the tender of it and, and go back the next day and do it again does it does it cause like your face to itch or you know have any? Oh yeah, it, it, it it's it's uh, and it's it's painful uh, really? when cause they're, when they they take it off as as careful as they are with the you know they're just peeling it off with a solvent to take it you know that that glue has to be something that will uh, stand up to sweat and and oil coming out of your pores and. So it's still stuck when they're taking it off. And so they're taking a layer of skin along with it. And, you know, so it can get kind of tender after, especially if you got someone who's not paying attention, but most of the people I've worked with are really, uh, you know, they're really top notch. And uh, so, you know, it's like, have you ever gotten a tattoo? No, no, not for me. Yet. It's like, it's like getting a really, really long tattoo because <laughs> you just got to, you just gotta sit there and like, don't move or it's gonna screw it up. Okay. <laughs> and oh, that's really uncomfortable. But, you know, here's here's and I'm gonna give you a, a something from the meditation side of things. If you're doing life right, there's gonna be a lot of moments of discomfort. Yeah. Because if you're not uncomfortable when you're standing in front of the camera and or in front of an audience, then you're not gonna give us your best stuff. You know, the, the, the willingness to sit in discomfort is, 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 is a prerequisite for the willingness to live out loud and live fully. So, In living out loud, uh, if any of these guys that are in my class um, are interested in doing a career in acting, uh, and at this point in their life, they've only done maybe one high school production, what mm -hmm. kind of advice would you give them if they're interested in following your footsteps? I'll, I'll start by saying there was a, a, a cat named Michael Shirtliff who was very big in the commercial world years ago and he wrote a book that was very, uh, it was read by everybody and I, I, I'm, uh, I, I can't remember the name of it at this moment, but his greatest piece of advice in that book was if you can do anything else, go do it because <laughs> if, if, if you're doing this to, to make a lot of money or to become famous or because you need approval, it ain't going to work out and you're going to be miserable. That said, even if you don't become an actor, if you're going to direct or write, one of the most valuable things you can do is to study uh, some technique based in, but what I come from is the Meisner technique. And Larry Moss is another teacher who has a lot, a lot to offer. But Meisner gave this extraordinary uh, wisdom and, and taught from this basis that all life exists in the other person. And the greatest 
a problem that an actor faces is self-consciousness. And if I'm watching myself, then I'm not living out loud. I'm not present. I'm not doing anything that will uh, be inspired or unexpected. And if I'm not an inspi inspired and doing something that I didn't expect, then the audience isn't going to be inspired or, or uh, uh, excited by what I'm doing. And when you learn to live in that place where you're putting your attention on the other person instead of on your own, mm -hmm. your own, your own self, then art has a chance to come in. And even as a director, you're going to learn about how to make a scene flow. As a writer, you're going to learn what the hell is someone going to say when they walk through the door? What would I say when I walk through the door if I, if I walked in and saw my wife sitting with a, another man? What would I say? You know, and so, well, I don't know. So let me put myself in that situation and open a door in my imagination and see them there and, and see what comes out of me. You know, and like this, that uh, getting in touch with that reality in yourself, that emotional truth in here um, is going to serve you no matter what you do. And, and, you know, and just remember that they don't call them plays for nothing. It's, you know, I get to pretend all these different ways of, of living without having to suffer the consequences of a whole career of it. You know, I'm not a devil worshiper. I'm not a junkie. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I haven't been to prison. I, you know, I, I, I've never killed a zombie, but I've got to do all those things in my imagination and in front of a camera and get paid for it. So having fun playing. Yeah. All right. So we're going to come to the point. Uh, now we're at five quick questions. So the way this is working, we're just going to ask you uh, a question or give you a statement and the first kind of thoughts that come through your head. Lord, Shoot you're up. a brave man. Do you, do you <laughs> have a beeping capacity here? If, if, if I if say it, be, I, I, we can do the beep. All right. Um, <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, 137 roles on your acting credit credits on IMDb. Let's go to role number one, B, 1985. The feet? V. V. Your oh, first. V. Role. Oh, yes. Jane Badler. I just saw Jane Badler six months ago. She was the, the the one of the stars of that. I played a lizard. I got I got my SAG card. Terrible, terrible show. <laughs> Um, your role that you got called back for, but you didn't get, and it still stinks. Oh, I just lost one last week. It was uh, there's a, they're doing a, a mini series on Netflix for the the uh, the book Made, and it was for the role of uh, uh, Margot Robbie's father. I and that's the one, and the one that I'm going to ask God about when I drop out of this body. I, I did a pilot called His Wives and Daughters where I played a, uh, a country western singer who had many wives and many daughters and, uh, and was just a, a kind of a ne'er-do-well but very charmingly so. My cardboard cutout was in the lobby of country music television next to Connie Britton's from Nashville. We were ready to go and then someone else bought the company and, and nixed us and I'm just going to say, what was that about? Because that was, when I described that character to my son, he just said, well, dad, that's you. Um, so that one, that one really hurt. Role you're most proud of? You know, I, China Beach, it was just, it, it was China Beach. Yeah, I mean, there, I've done better work since then, but that one mattered and it, it, it really left a mark. You're, you're a standout photographer, so the art of photography. Photography, you have to, you're learning how to see, and it's a it's a it's a learned skill. And again, it's about putting attention outside yourself. There's something that happens when I go from here to a pen, or from here to a subject through the lens, or from here to a partner in an acting scene. There's something in that spaciousness of that connection between me and you that can allow for flow to occur and that can allow for something bigger than me to come in. And I, I had a friend who uh, curated a show and what, 
what I, the photography that I do mostly is, is wet plate collodion or tin type photography. And it's a really long shutter. You know, it's like two seconds to 10 seconds to 12 seconds for the, for the enough light to get on there to make a picture. And so people have to sit very still. But when my friend curated the show, he talked about, he says, these aren't snapshots. These are, these are portraits of a passage of time. Mm. You know, that's, a, that's 12 seconds that is on this, this plate. 12 seconds of life being lived. And that's, as artists, that's what we're always trying to capture is just life, you know. So. Fifth question on these, uh, challenge. Uh, thank you so much for being a part of this, but here's, here's your challenge. Who would you invite to join us in this conversation and why? Tony, Tony Glazer is a producer, writer, and director that I've worked with several times. He's, he and his wife, Summer Crockettmore, uh, are uh, two of my heroes and two of my dearest friends. They uh, have a studio in uh, Newburgh, New York. They're shooting films up there, or they will be shortly again. We did a series recently called uh, Big Dog, which is available on Amazon Prime. Just got up to almost 40 million views, so I think that's that's pretty good. Um, and and Tony is uh, he's he's so well spoken and he thinks deeply and uh, he's got a great sense of humor and he's got a, a, a really big heart. So he's someone who uh, I, I, I can imagine him saying yes to this. And, All right, cool. uh, and if, he, if he doesn't, then I'll just make fun of him. So. <laughs> well, let's get him on. Let's get him on. Okay. So Jeff Gobert, thank you for you know taking these moments with us and sharing the art that you do. And thank you for a long career in film and television. We really appreciate you being here with us. Oh, God bless you, man. Thanks for having me, and, and uh, good luck to y'all. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff, for being a part of the class, and thank you for your long career in television and film, giving us characters that we have absolutely despised in the most honorable ways for you as an actor, to those that we have truly fallen in love and enjoyed, such as in your character. And Hank girl. Guys, this is it for our class. As always, remain awesome, be nice, stay safe, and I'll see you guys soon.